jokes. Um, the last talk I gave at Berkeley, and then Ron Graham was at the dinner afterwards, and I said, what joke did you like the best? And he, he, what he commented on wasn't even a joke. He said, when you said I'm trying not to be too wild. <laughs> so, but I will try not to be too wild. But that's a fairly wild talk. Fortunately, everybody can hear me okay? Okay. There's going to be a test on this at the end. You can definitely hear. Okay. Um, okay, fortunately, I completely changed the talk. But that was so vague that you'll never know. Okay. Uh, oh. Now, I don't know how to do this, though. Uh, I'm going to change the slide. Is that, oh, that's good. Okay. Uh, where's the mic? Did I lose it? No, it's everything's fine. Okay, pretty general talk. Um, okay, geometry and topology are, are, are topics in general math. And mathematics is all mathematics. Okay, so the talk today is a little modest talk. It's called Geometry and Topology Equal the Linked Equations in Finite Semigroup Theory. So what we're doing is we're, today we're going to relate all of mathematics. There's only 55,000 papers a year now. So all of mathematics to finite semigroup theory. Okay. Okay. And we're going to relate geometry and topology to the linked equations. We're going to say they're basically the same. And we're going to say all of mathematics is the presentation one. Okay, so that's the modest goal today. I, the joke I'm not going to tell is that you have to write an essay in 7,000 words in either Hungarian or Italian comparing Volkov, Misha Volkov style lecturing in mind. <laughs> I'm not telling that joke. Okay. Uh, and I am 81, so I can get to sit down if I want. And I want. Okay. So we'll start with live nets. Oh, okay, so I have some slides that Pedro typed up, but then I'm going to write here too. Uh, okay, live nets said everything can be written in zeros and ones. And that's zero, one star, and everything can be approximated as such. So what this means is if, if you're if we're going to, in math, if, if we're going to talk string theory, or we're going to talk Ramanian geometry, string theory, okay, these are uh, the Kittenbuds male for the talk and work by different money, so oh, you're doing discrete math, yes. Okay, but the point is, I'll say after Leibniz, is, and we all know this now, okay, everything can be approximated by zeros and ones. So continuous things can be broken into little pieces, can be approximated by zeros and ones. So it doesn't matter if it's continuous, there's going to be some finite analog. That's the idea. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, this gets very subtle and it's not so well understood. I mean, or wasn't. There's a very nice book. I hope you remember, there's 55,000 math papers a year. 8% of them, I think, are good. That's over 4,000. And a lot of books, 10% are good. Okay, so, anyway, and here's a nice book. I'll just make a positive book. But what this book proves is if you take finite topological spaces, they can't be T2. Because that's trivial, but okay. But you take, okay. And you look at those up to weak homotopy, they're the same as CW complex up to homotopy. But this was not understood until fairly recently, since the 80s. Okay, so that's an example. That's an example. And now there's finite Morse theory, which is probably a better way to do things. Okay, so you, you get the idea that restricting to discrete and finite is really no restriction. Everybody in that fifth, 60s, like, when I said that, everybody thought that was crazy, but now that we know about computers and Al Gore created the internet, that's all clear. Okay, so this is a nice book. Uh, and this really goes back to Hausdorff, that, that, that from a certain point of view, I mean, finite topologies are closed sets, are finite closed sets. So that's to explain first the crazy idea that you can make everything discrete. Okay. Okay. Oh wait, did I miss something there? Okay. Uh, I think we've all read that. Okay. Really 
was right there. Okay. Okay. Now, of course, the principle I'm going to use, which the other speakers don't, is the usual principle of, of speakers of mathematics. I assume you know all mathematics except what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> okay, then you got the joke. <laughs> oh, another joke, I kind of stopped telling joke, is in my, I used to teach math classes, I used to say, if you understand the material, I'm going to tell jokes. And if you understand the material, you can hurt yourself falling down laughing. And if you don't understand the material, you'll even know it's a joke, and that's the first joke. <laughs> okay, I'll try not to. Okay, so the length equations in front of the semigroup. Okay, now that, this means we're going to go to the blackboard. But what I want to comment here is references is, uh, uh oh, Stein, uh, the, okay. He's the one that's telling us we really want to do partial maps, because you can do the whole representation through for partial maps up to the read equivalent. So other people knew, but th this is a great paper. It's, it's a great theorem. And it, so he can do the representation. Take all partial maps on a finite set, he can do the representation. Okay, uh, up to the read equivalent. Then just the, sta the, sta the two standard books. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to write on this thing. Okay, what I really want to say is that everybody knows the length equation, so what my... Okay. Oh, now I have to... Am I going to do this? Did it... Didn't work. Oh, it's the upper one I push? Yes. Hey. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, another joke. Okay. For those who are at the 88, I hope we'll get this on the app, but okay. In the 88, what's it, 88 conference in uh, Lisbon, okay, uh, it was the first time I used slides, because, you know, okay, and, but I wasn't very good at it, so what happened is I didn't write on them. I had 50 slides, I didn't write them on it, I just threw them over my shoulder roughly if I had written on them about the level of a go. Okay, I've improved since then. I think. Okay. Okay, I only get one lecture a year. I don't know. I gotta write something, but you all know this. Okay. <laughs> or if you don't, but everybody knows the length equations, but I'll, I'll write something. Okay. So Reese here. Okay. Okay. So, so what is this? I'm not going to write. Okay. So, so we have A, B, then we have this man. I'm not going to figure out A into G, zero. Okay. And it's a, a regular map, meaning uh, in every row and column, that's a non-zero entry. So we know Reeves theorem. You're supposed to know Reeves theorem. Okay. Can you hear the trumpets blowing? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, so, 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 okay, so the theorem is that we're a zero simple finite semi group if and only if the, we have a Reis matrix. Okay, now the way math goes, the way math goes is you do things in coordinates and then 50 years later you get rid of the coordinates. But, you, but I started coordinates. And then it is good to get rid of, but everybody thinks in the beginning of coordinates. I mean, what else? Okay. So we're doing coordinates here. Merida equivalents will get rid of them. So, so it's bubble up, boil down. The Eilenberg captain, he did tell me. Okay, so we have Reis matrix semi group. Okay, so what we're going to do, okay, so there's the egg box picture. Yes, thank you, Clifford and Preston. Next is zero. Okay. Um, okay, so we want the length equation. So we now want, basically want the biggest semigroup you can. We're going to call this a translational hall. I guess I'll call that R. I'm not going to do this too first. Okay. And, okay, so we want everybody, we want the biggest semigroup that this is the zero simple thing in the bottom, and it's the length equations. Now, how many people in the room will admit they don't know length equations? That are mathematicians. Uh-oh. This is bad. Oh, I thought there was going to be men. Ah, okay, sorry. Okay. E. Well, the length equations are, okay, so we have a T here. 
Okay. And the ba okay, and the mat okay. So first of all, the Reese matrix semigroups has elements A, G, B. Right? And you can operate on the left. I mean if you have thing, or you can have A, G, B, and you can operate on the right. Right? Okay. And the way okay, and these are partial maps because we have a zero here. Okay, so A G B is it's A G B of T B of T. Now what this means is the T operates on the B's. I call them B's, you call them L classes. I call them A's, you call them R classes. That's where they're gonna use coordinates in. So the T here operates on these coordinates. I'm gonna do coordinates. You want to do coordinates in the beginning, you figure out the theorem in the beginning, and then you or other people work 50 years to get rid of the group. That's called math. That's how it goes. That is the right way to do it. Okay, so now you can write this out as a row monomial matrix, which is another form of the wreath product. Now many people say Schitzenberger representation, not that just get to go to Paris, but it's an important idea and it's used, but it's the wreath product. I'm not sure too many people realize that. Okay, so you have a B here, and you look where, where it goes, and then you write a star there. So there's zero, 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 zero. The binomial means going that way, there's at most one non-zero entry. And then at the star, you just put in any group element, but the one you put in we call B of T. And that's a Roman, and this is called um, uh, a right binomial because I'm doing right, of T or Schitzenberger, since I'm not pan, I'll be honest about proof things. Okay, sorry. Um, okay. Okay, so here's a nice Roman omeo matrix. And it's got, okay, we have, okay, I'll, and then there's the dual thing. And then the linked equations are, oh, do people, did everybody, the, Okay, you happy? You're learning? Okay, so here's this. Okay. Um, okay, so the linked equation is really, okay. I mean, it's supposed to be, among us, it's got to be associative. So if you have A, G, B, and you put a T there, and an A prime, and a G prime, and a B, and this is, or this might be zero, this has got to be that. Right? Okay, so you write down what that means. And that means you have this matrix C, which is B cross A. When I used to teach this, you do Jake Bond analysis. Can I say that anymore? That, you know, when you multiply matrices, the middle thing's got to agree. So you have to check shapes. Okay, so this is B A, and here you do the right monomial of T times C, and that's got to be C left monomial of T, and that's the linked equation. Okay, hey, okay, we're all supposed to know this. Now, the set of everybody that's linked, okay, uh, and written out in maps this way, that's called the translational hull. So what we care about is we, 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 we somebody gives me a reason to make semigroup. So in every row and column, this is, so you give me a group, you give me an A, you give me a B, you give me a matrix, and every row and column of the matrix, there's a non-zero entry. You go look at this thing, and now you're going to make the biggest thing you can, that that's the zero minimal thing on the bottom, and so that's all the things that are linked, okay? And I gave you the equation, okay. And that's called the translational hull, okay? And those are great. And that's got R in it. So you're really interested in S. You're really interested in everybody that contains the bottom and is, is linked. And, and usually the top guy is the most interesting, but not, okay, it's interesting. Okay, that's what we're doing. Okay, that's, okay, that's the linked equations. Oh, now, now this looks like the slide rule in uh, category theory, uh, because the linked equations also, when you write them down, they mean this. When Straubing wrote a book, when we all write books, we realize all this material we're supposed to know, we don't. <laughs> okay, so, okay. All right, so that's the linked questions. Okay, so here's a, 
Here's a Roman nomeo times a matrix equals a matrix times. Okay, fine. Uh, okay. So now you know the link. If you don't, you can read it in Clifford and Preston. You can read it in Q theory. Uh, oh, oh, what, how did I do that? How do I get rid of it? She's working on it. Oh, I see. Okay. I, I, I always mess things up. Okay, don't, don't worry. Okay, it's going pretty well so far. Uh, okay, now I, I'm sure I, I did something. It's my fault. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, now I don't know why people don't know this, but I want to say Schitt's measure representation is great, but it's the Reeves product. Okay, so now you got this guy in the bottom. And we're looking at translational hall. Now, okay, now you got to know. See, I don't see how people do semi group theory, they don't know this, but okay, right mapping. Any right mapping means you're faithful when you operate on the right here. Now, all the translations, by definition, we had it. But right mapping means if you have a semigroup with a zero minimal guy in there, uh, right mapping means when you operate on the right, you're faithful at the bottom. That means when you operate on, on, on uh, right map means when you operate on, on G cross B as partial maps, you're faithful. Got it? That's all it means. Okay? So the shit's a bit here, right? If this thing is regular, we're, we're assuming the bottom's regular. Reeves theorem, we're operating on the right. Okay? If it, we make it faithful, that's called right mapping. Then, then the, those maps have a representation as a row monomial matrices, and that's called the Schitzebergia representing that at first. But that's the real product. People don't seem to understand that. Okay, the Reeve product comes in immediately. Okay, that's, okay, there's a dual idea, faithful on the left. Okay, now the next one is what group mapping is. In complexity or anything, if you only want to take the group, is group mapping means you're faithful on the right and the left. Now, what does that mean? It means the first, the matrix down there, there's no proportional rows or columns. You multiply the Bs on that side, the A, I'm not right. Okay, so, so what group mapping, which I'm going to now say is all mathematics, so I think it's important. Okay, group mapping means you operate faithfully on the right and left, and that means that down on the bottom, there's no proportional rows or columns. And that means that the group is one, all the rows and columns that have, are, 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 are unequal. Okay? Okay, and generalized group mapping is just group mapping, but uh, generalized group. This means the group isn't one, and this means the group is one. So group mapping means you're operating uh, uh, faithfully on the right and the left, and the group is non-trivial. And intuitively, that's the simplest algebraic way to know, to compute that group. Because you can identify rows and columns, and that's not hurting the group, okay? The whole idea, then, of the presentation of in math is, is there any other way to do it? We'll get to that. Okay, so what group mapping means. So group mapping... If you start with a Reeves matrix regular semigroup, you look at the translational home. So that, okay, okay, but the one you start with has purport, no proportional rows and columns. Okay? Okay. So that means if you operate faithful on the right, then you automatically operate faithful on the left. Okay? Uh, I think that's all we have to know. Now, wait, I pushed that one. And I wait two minutes. One minute. I pushed the top, the bottom. Bottom. Gee. No, that was wrong. That's the slides should come back. Oh, maybe he. No, I'm not getting the slides back. Press the bottom and wait a few seconds. Bottom. Keep pressing it. 
There. My wife can say she's okay. Okay. No, but see, I don't know left or right at all. And I was left handed, but they don't let you do that in Ohio in the 30s, so okay. But in semi group theory, that helps. We, we haven't got left or right. The whole idea of semi group theory is that left or you can't. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go. How do I go to the next slide? Boy, this is all too complicated. Okay. How are we doing time wise? This is just a stall. There's a lot of work. I'm, what time am I done? Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, back to the slides. In the spatial case of generalized group man. So that means we take a we're taking a matrix of zeros and ones of uh, a, 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 a zero in non-zero rows and columns, and no columns and no rows are equal. That's a GGM. And then we do a translational whole of that, or anybody in between. Okay. And now, now we're going to do Margolis' thesis, basically. Stu, oh, no, Stuart, I guess. Okay. Um, okay. So notice the following thing. Now we're, now we're trying to say, what's this got to do with topology or geometry? And my answer is, watch Stuart's talk, which is the last talk in the conference. But, okay. Okay. But so on the bottom... Um, this is the Tilson number. So I'll stand on the bottom and look at the maximal number of ones in any row. That's the Tilson number of the degree now or whatever. Okay, now it's clear for the maps at the bottom that what degree means is how many elements map to the same element. So the degree is take the inverse image of any point and see what the size is and maximize it. So degree is the number of points that can map to a single point, max. Now it's clear the degree, okay, so it's clear at the bottom, if there's 71 ones in a row, then there's somebody in the bottom that says 71 people to one, and then that, clearly that's true for the whole thing. Because you can multiply anybody in the big thing and get something in the bottom. I guess that's okay. Fine. Okay. So Stuart Margolis' thesis was, it's known that for those that know what complexity is, is that if, if, if the maximal number of ones in any row of the group mapping thing down there is six or whatever it is, that, that bounds of complexity. Okay, so we're now going to look at degree two, so we know the complexity of the translation of Hall is at most two. By Margolis' thesis, Okay, now there's a graph. It's, okay, so now we're trying to get into some geometry. Now, if you think about what the linked equations mean in the GGM case, or that means when the matrix just has no the group as one, it means when you look at rows, the inverse image of one of those rows has to be another one, or empty. <coughs> the inverse image of each row has to where it's one, has to be another row somewhere. That tells you how to operate on the other side, or empty. This is the tie-up with topology and geometry. The tie-up with topology is the inverse image open is open. So that means it's continuous if you look at those as open. Okay, but then there's more geometry involved if you look at them as lines. That's what Stuart's going to talk about. Okay, so now we can get a graph. In the degree two case, we can get the obvious graph. Now, now there's either, when you look at a row, we don't write the zero rows. So some row, and I'm going to put in all the rows with a one. So assume all the rows are there that have exactly one one. Some of the rows are there that have two. Nobody has more. We're, we're thinking, but don't write it. You're allowed zero, zero, zero. Okay. Now what link means is the inverse image of those is another one. But what that, okay, but that's a graph, because if I look at the big idea, when there's two ones there, there's a graph, got it? So if you take two ones and cycle it, you're going to cycle. So if I give you, uh-oh, oh, no, I'm probably, oh, doesn't matter, I'm not doing this. Okay, wait, this has to be out. Okay, um, People can still hear? Yeah. All right. Uh, is somebody, are you following this pretty clear? Yeah, that's what it is. I usually pick somebody to check. 
Okay. Okay, so this is a pretty simple idea. There's the graph. Okay, now the translational hall is the automorphism of the graph. But the group theorists, since they don't know which way they're going, because the group's isomorphic is reversed, they got it backwards. You don't want to look at it that way. You want to look at it because it's the inverse image. If a map's one to one, it more or less doesn't matter when you take inverse image to track. Okay, so now the in, okay, so the definition of translational hall, when you translate it into a degree less or equal to two, look at it as graph theory, look what happens. Stuart, I uh, just did this recently, and those are going to be worth with Pedro uh, Silva. Um, okay, so the automorphism group of the graph is the group, but the point is, we now know the right definition of morphism of a graph. See, see, in math, it's complicated. Like, there's lattice, but why do they say semi-lattice? They're all lattices. It's what the arrows are, what the category is. Okay, so right away we're going to tell you, hey guys, in graph theory, the right category is partial maps, so that the inverse image of a point is either a point or, a, or a, an edge. And the inverse image of an edge is either nothing, point, or edge. That's the right definition. Okay? From our view, right? Sorry. Okay. So everybody knows crap because, okay. So this, oh, okay, now, now then, okay, so, oh, so let's do the theory of that a little bit. Well, this research is about a month old. You're smiling and doing okay? You need to switch it to the camera. What? Oh, up. What, do I push it up? Okay, this is to encourage the students. Okay, Einstein said you should be an example, either of what to do or what not to do. I, I couldn't decide, so I do both. Okay. Now I forgot what I was going to say. And because he came out, see, it's like, you interrupt me, Lauren, and I can't remember what I'm going to say. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, the big idea. So all right, here's a big idea. So what do these maps look like? Well, first, here, the map's F, and it's partial. Stein says partial. Okay, now these are so that F inverse of a point is two elements. Okay? Okay, so that means you'll see... Okay, there's got to be these edges here that map to this. So if you restrict, what if we make the graph strict so every row has two guys in it? Okay, okay. So now, uh, okay, so the inverse image of a point has got to be an edge if, if P inverse of F inverse is 2. Okay, that's all, that's all that can happen. Anything else isn't going to work. And notice, big, big, big idea, this is a matching. Okay, so what you do is you take a matching of the graph, and, and then you, you map those any way you want to disjoint points. Okay, okay. And, okay, so that's going to tell you the longest chain, the regular chain classes is the max, is the is the matching number, and you can start reading all this stuff and matching. Okay, matching's a big, so, okay. Okay, then over here you have a map where F, P of inverse, inverse is one. Okay, so this is gonna be partial one to one, but now here the inverse image of an edge has to be an edge, and there can't be any edges there. So you see how to decompose these things. But already graph there is committed. Okay? Okay. So we're writing a paper of what's the complexity of these, of course. That's two or one, rich. Okay? Okay. Now I can get more profound, and, and, and we can get... Wilson has this great theorem, This, but you listen to Stuart's talk. Stuart Margolis, last talk of the conference. You look at that talk, but um, um, Rick Wilson in 70 proved this great theorem. But it's like, um, soon you have a geometry, and what a geometry means, Stuart's going to do this, is, is if, okay, now we're now Euclidians, so we got to get geometry in this. A partial Euclidean geometry is, 
is a bunch of sets that only intersect in one or no points. Take a finite set, take a bunch of finite subsets, and so, okay. Now what that means is any two points determine nothing or one line. Because these things I chose are line. So you pick subsets of order two through big, a little look at a two or more, and the intersection of any two are empty or one. Okay. So, okay. So you can make that geometry better, and you say any two points determine exactly one line. And then those are going to be piecewise uh, balanced designs in design theory. Okay, but you see it's like Euclidean geometry. Steiner crystal systems, Steiner cripple systems are, are a bunch of sets all with three elements that any pair determine exactly one line. Okay? Okay, but now you can have the lines be two, six, and nine. So you can say all oh, the lines. Okay, so we're interested in, first I give you a K, which tells me how big the lines can be. K, and K is a subset of two, three, four, five. Okay. And, uh, and, but, and then the axiom is every pair of points determines exactly one line. And then there's some trivial necessary conditions that this exists. Okay. I, I, I can tell you, but okay, like for a tri Steiner triple system, okay, uh, two has to divide the number of points minus one, so there's another condition. And there, there's some trivial conditions that have been known forever. And, he, and uh, what Rick Wilson proved, the big theorem that if you, if for big enough things, if the trivial conditions are true and the number of points is big enough, they do exist. Now, usually there's billions, and they just prove they want. Okay, Stuart's going to talk about that. So, so, and this is all related to what the, the translational hall was, okay? So you can now go to Stuart's talk. Okay. Um, what do I put? Oh, yeah, that's my boy. No, no. What, what, up, down? Down. Down. Wait. I have to leave go. Hey! Okay, so then read that, Stuart. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, Pedro and Stuart and I wrote a paper of Wilson. So, and then uh, when Stuart was at, at the University of Vermont, right down the street was Ben and Jerry. And when he went to Ben and Jerry's, there was Ben, there was Ben Jerry, and there was uh, Bernie. And he actually sat there and talked to all three of them. Are you saying something? Bernie Sanders, for those who yeah. won't know. All right. Okay, that's where the, all this started. There's Wilson. Now, okay. Okay, good. Uh, how many minutes? How many minutes do I have to explain all the math? Oh, eight. Yeah, eight. Yeah, okay. Uh, the presentation of and funny seven groups is enough necessarily decided unless there's this condition. Okay. Okay. Um, for those that know complexity, okay, it doesn't matter. Okay. If you have a group mapping semigroup, so okay, so I'll say it again. We have a Reese matrix semigroup over a non-trivial group, no row and column is proportional. And we have something in the trans that it contains the bottom, it's inside the translational hole. Okay? Um, oh, okay, that's group mapping. Oh, maybe I didn't even tell you. What right letter mapping and group mapping is, you just operate on the B's. Yeah, okay, so you take this Roman only on. to see what you're writing. Sorry. Okay. You take the group mapping semigroup and you go right letter mapping. Oh, oh, I'm gonna, oh, this is too hard. I pushed up. Sorry. It's too hard. I didn't even tell you right letter mapping. That's how pretty I'm going to be. So you have the ships of every shape things, just get rid of the group and make it one. Okay, so operate on the Bs, operate on the L classes. Okay, so you can go from group mapping, which is algebraically the nicest way to calculate that group, but but only nice algebraic. You go to right letter mapping. Okay, the complexity, okay, the, by big theorems, 
There's this transaction paper. It was up there somewhere. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. By big theorems, to compute complexity, this changes one or, or zero from GM because Schitzinger shows you you get it back by reading a group. So group mapping to right letter mapping either changes one or none in complexity. If you know what complexity is. And the question is that which? The presentation level tells you the crazy time that it doesn't change. See, because doing right letter mapping and, and then putting on the group and just calculate all the Bs, and then of course you can do the group. Okay, but maybe you don't need all the Bs. Maybe you can just do some other crazy thing and have less information than all the Bs. Okay, that's complexity. Okay, I push down. How do I get back? I can't, why can't I remember? Okay. Uh, okay, good. Now, the presentation of, okay, now there's this, okay, you can read it, Ben went, sat down and wrote a hundred pages of complexity one night on the road. Okay, you read chapter four. This is very hard stuff, and then it's even harder the transaction paper. One of the, one of the authors can't read it. Okay. Okay, now I cannot explain the presentation in time allowed. A semester might be enough, it's probably wrong. It's not enough. So let me relate other math and show it's a fairly standard idea. Okay. Now that's what I said before. Okay. Now what's now, 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 now how to get it into standard math is that GM is a G bundle over right letter map. You, you can go look at the reference that's going to be up, oh yeah, the McLean. They write a hundred pages of this. So this is how Eilenberg got interested in the prime decomposition theorem. It's, if you know, you, we of course read Steenrod's fiber bundles. Okay, and that's, the, the GM is a, it's a G bundle of the right letter map. And then all mathematics does is all mathematics, Stiefel Whitney, Sherb Simons, Okay, is, uh, it, and that thing that he does, is if you give me a fiber bundle, okay, like Steenrod, you, you do an obstruction theory, and you try to write a global cross-section. You try to get a map going the other way, that's defined, okay, and there's an obstruction, and that's mathematics. It's Stiefel Whitney, it's uh, Grothendieck, it's Churn Simons, it's a lot of math, okay? Okay, so that is math. Okay, it's called classified space. Okay, they write, this shows a major connection. What's going, the presentation of it is a way to write down this obstruction. Uh, boy, three things here. Oh, oh, <laughs> okay. uh, how many minutes do I have? Oh, that's probably too much. <laughs> Here's another way to look at it. If you want us to read it. Wait a minute. Here's group mapping, and we want to know just the complexity. When, when, can, when does this not change? When is the complexity here, whatever this is, which is explained in the Q book? John, you want us to read what you're writing. I can only, you know, process. Thank you. Okay, there. Okay, yeah, okay. So, what if these are the same? The I mean, how can this happen? Okay, well, what the presentation on another form, and what it is, as I told you, what the presentation on is in another form, it magically, Ben would say it this way, it magically gives you a direct sign. It says, if this crazy, let's call this non-pure or crazy. Non-pure means Right letter mapping has the same complexity as group mapping. So that means you're doing some very strange way to calculate that group. And it's not by calculating all the Bs or the L classes first. You're doing less. That's the only way it can happen. Okay. Now we have necessary and sufficient condition. Okay, but then that's not decidable. Okay, but what they prove is if the, cra if it, if the crazy thing happens, if it's not pure, this is then you can write things this way. You can write things as right letter mapping cross, 
And we know what this group is, symmetric group on the B's root G, so we actually know what it is. And then the, the first thing, so there's some crazy aperiodic machine. Read a group, I can tell you what it is. Direct product, right letter mapping. That's the only way the crazy can happen. Now in the old days, I said direct product is easy. Reef product is, is hard. Well, that turns out wrong. They're both crazy. So <laughs> you can't do either. They're both undecidable. But so, but so this is where this, so this is what's going on. Now we know what this is, and we know what that is. The presentation level tells you what that is, which almost nobody understands. Now what's making that complicated? For example, if type two is aperiodic, then you can make that one. So the presentation level, uh, if you make A01, is, is okay, and the same for inverse semigroup. Kelsen is 67. So, okay. So the reason the group map, okay. So it's fiber bundles over this G bundle, okay. And, 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 and now the trouble with this is, is even though Stiefel, Whitney, um, obstructions, uh, Hochschul, cohomology, all the philosophies the same, Florical, but then the details are all different. Okay, the so detail, and the devil's in the details. Okay, so, okay, so that's, okay, so, oh, so this is really what's going on. We do not understand this A0. I do know if you put the free burn side there, it works. The free burn side bounded. We know that works. And there's this great paper in transactions, lower bounds, that extremely hard to read. Okay, about okay. At any rate, that explains all this. Um, that's pretty good. Okay, everybody, everybody, okay, that's it. So wait, I got no, 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 no. I gotta get this. I gotta get the thank you slide. Okay. No, what? Oh, not one minute. I'm gonna get it. <laughs> Yeah, we're saying the right definition of morphism for a graph is A partial B, the inverse image, okay, take empty set point edge. When you took the inverse image of any one of those, you want to get another one of those. So that means the inverse image of a point can be nothing, a point, or an edge. The inverse image of an edge can be nothing, a point, or an edge. And that's the right definition of morphism, but that also makes the translation a whole. Right. So, so, so if I give you a graph, you can do the translation a whole, and we know it's complex in zero or one way. Okay, so if you just have inverse image of an edge of an edge, I think you can inverse something like this. Yeah. That's it's just complexity one. Okay. And yes, that's correct. Right.